Le Cordon Bleu College of Culinary Arts is dedicated to preparing aspiring professionals in the areas of culinary arts, patisserie and baking, and hospitality and restaurant management. Disaster Planning and Response Art Rescue is a first responder for the world of art, providing planning, packing, evacuation, conservation, and storage for all your treasured possessions. Thanks for joining me on Fear No Art. My name is Elizabeth Alfano. Come with me as I go behind the scenes and we get into the unique and fascinating world of the independent artist. Today, I'll be speaking with acclaimed cartoonist and graphic novelist Chris Ware as he welcomes me into his home and studio for a look inside his complex world. Chris, thank you for having me here in your home. Sure. I was recently reading one of your Acme uh, Novelty Library series, and there was a strip that said, ruin your life, draw cartoons, yeah. and doom yourself. Right. And I wondered if you could comment on how much work you create and what compels you. Ah, uh, geez, that's a big question. Um, well, this, I did the strip uh, a couple of years after I finished um, a book called Jimmy Corrigan, which took me seven years to do. It's crazy, basically, sitting at a table and drawing these pictures and looking into this world for a long period of time. So I have this theory that all cartoonists eventually go nuts at one point or another. It's not actually too far-fetched, because the hours and toiling and re-looking and staring and tunneling in all day long, that would send anyone over the edge. Tunneling is a very good verb. That's good. I never thought of that. Can I use that? You can I'll use give you credit. <laughs> I mean, I think <laughs> writers, I mean, they do the same thing, but I don't think it takes as long. And there's something about looking at words on a page that is different than looking at pictures that you've drawn. When you're looking at things that you've drawn, the feedback loop becomes that much more intense and sort of loud, I guess. I think writing, it can get into sort of a buoyant flow where you almost kind of create the, the river as you're rowing in it, but there's nothing like that in cartooning. It's like trying to live in a house while you're building it or something. It's not a very comfortable proposition. Could you talk to me about how important the layout and coloring is? Um, yeah, I would say it's very important. I mean, it's probably one of the most important things. It's certainly one of the, the distinct advantages of drawing comics and publishing them as books because you're working in discrete units of pages which are sort of analogous to the way that we divide and, and break up our own memories and where we choose to start and stop them. One of the reasons I try to make the books look at least as nice as I can or I try to do things that might possibly be considered in some places beautiful on the page is to, is to try to contradict what's going on within the characters' minds and to to say that, well, look, it's not so bad if you're looking at something that is, because I think when we remember things, we tend to remember them in a very organized, Later. beautiful way in yeah. some ways, and that in the world itself actually is, is very beautiful, and experience can be beautiful. It's just a matter of seeing it that way. So I try to right. put those things together as it working against each other. So as for the color, I try to use color somewhat naturalistically, but I also use it in a way to connect uh, themes or objects or people on the page in sort of a multi it's basically my, like my last chance like if the page isn't working <laughs> hopefully I can fix it with the colors what I'm hoping to do is just to, to, to make it as clear as possible what's going on on the page and to make the images really not necessarily that interesting but just easily readable uh -huh. so that then the story can be as confusing and difficult to sort out as my own experiences are. As if I had the images and the drawings be as difficult to sort out as the story, then it would be difficult to read. Most of your characters have emotional deficiencies and are still hung up on, on childlike insecurities. Yeah. And as adults, we all expect ourselves to get over this, and mm -hmm. none of us do. And so I, I feel that you strike a common chord with the average reader, that they connect to this childlike insecurity that they still have. Oh, that's nice. And I wondered um, if you have any hope of how you connect with your reader. Maybe to draw out or sympathetically harmonize with certain experiences that they've had or possibly forgotten that then I've remembered by, by drawing certain stories. One of the things I like about comics is that it's, I know that whoever is going to read it, if anybody reads it, it'll just be one person. It's not going to be a lot of people at once and that it's a very solitary kind of private experience. Because comics were about the only medium that a reader could expect to go to to get a very particular emotional reaction for decades. And I yes. 
was one of my aims as a young cartoonist to try to bring other emotions to comics other than just, you know, laughing or derision. So many of your characters have some of your own traits, like Rusty Brown is a collector, and as yeah. we can see around us, you are clearly a collector. Right. And uh, Jimmy Corrigan, smartest kid on earth, he has these feelings that maybe his father won't like him when he finally gets a chance to meet him. Right. And I wondered what it's like for you to work through your own feelings on the page. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't really think I could do anything else. That's why I do what I do, I suppose. I don't know if I could actually typify what it's like, other than it's, um, I'm, I'm sort of at a flat line of self-doubt. It, sometimes it goes down a little bit, sometimes it goes up much higher than that, but I'm always very dubious of both my aims and my abilities. So um, maybe that comes out in the, in the work, I don't know, or in the comics. I hate the word work. When you were talk about your, what you do, it sounds so pretentious, but. Well, it, it's it, incredible to me how you undermine, in a way, yourself and your accomplishments because you have so many. Well, I don't know. I mean, you know, I wouldn't, when I look back at what I've done, I'll, I'll, all I can, it just, it looks, like all I can see are mistakes or the terrible drawing or like, oh, geez, this character's eye is four inches off to the side and I just think it looked fine to me when I drew it, but now I can look back and think, oh, this is horrible, or just, I'll just see right through the, the uh, the lies or the or the terrible writing and I you know and it's I try to be as honest and and, and um, distant from myself as I can while I'm writing to try to see things as accurately as I can but it it hardly ever works. Which brings me to my next question: So many of your characters <laughs> okay. feel hopeless, uh -huh. feel certainly lonely. So many of them feel unconnected and unfulfilled and sad and depressed and despondent oh, they're feeling so, sounds so grim <laughs> I wonder is the world that bad oh uh, no I don't think so I mean um, there's just certain periods at which I mean I go back and forth between feeling that way and then feeling not that way especially since um, my daughter was born yeah. it sort of answered all questions I had about life and all doubts I had in a way it's sort of the magic switch that needs to be flipped in a lot of us to just mm -hmm. get out of yourself as the protagonist of the, you know, universe, yes. basically. I feel pretty happy about the way my life has turned out, but that doesn't mean anything to anybody else, you know. I right. think happiness is overrated, actually. I don't, I mean, it's, it's, it's a very private sort of emotion. Well, I think the highest compliment anyone could ever get is to be loved by Linda Berry. So she has true. <laughs> said wonderful things about your work, and I'm wondering, do you like your work? Uh, no, not really. Um, so, you know, I go back and forth between kind of tolerating it and occasionally thinking, well, that didn't turn out so badly, uh, to really just violently hating it. Do you feel that your work has value? Your I art has value? I, you, you know, you hope as an artist that it does. You know, maybe if I'm doing something that maybe it'll be interesting to somebody who hasn't been born yet, but I, that's not for me to judge, you know. I think it's just important to be nice to people. I mean, that sounds so dumb. But it really is true in a lot of ways. I think that really when a lot of literature just boils down to that, to remember to be kind and sympathetic and empathetic to other mm -hmm. organisms, basically. So I don't know where else any sort of idea of civilization can head beyond that. There's an artist and a creative spirit around every corner and in a few home offices. Join me on the next Fear No Art as we get into the unique and fascinating world of the independent artist. I see you very much as almost having cult figure-like status. I, you know, okay. I don't know. Okay, <laughs> all right. Oh, that's the weird cartoonist guy in the back there organizing the paper, He's but... strange. I understand that um, you play ragtime piano. I wondered if you'd like to play it. I this. would not, no. I would, you would, I would, that would be truly horrifying. So I, sorry, you really do not want me to do that. I'm going to look at my Chi-Chi now, see what I forgot. <laughs> okay. I,